Greetings and welcome to Films of State, uh, Moving Images Made by Governments. I'm Martin Johnson, Assistant Professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I'm pleased to moderate uh, our fourth panel, Infrastructure of Public Diplomacy. So I will introduce uh, all of our panelists first, and then I will play their recorded uh, talks, and then after we will have a lengthy discussion with our panelists, you'll be able to ask questions using the Q&A feature of Zoom, so please ask any questions as they come up there, and then I will be the moderator uh, after. So first up, we have Nick Cole, and Nick Cole is a professor of communication at the University of Southern California. And Cole is one of the leading scholars in the field of public diplomacy and has published many books and articles on the history of the role mass communication played in foreign policy, including most recently, Public Diplomacy, Foundations for Global Engagement in the Digital Age, which is published by Polity in 2019. Next, we have Hongwei Thorn Chen, who is an assistant professor of communication and Asian studies at Tulane University. He's currently working on a book titled Governing the Audiovisual, Cinema and Education in Republican China, 1918 to 1952, which examines how education and tutelage served as the organizing rationalities of instructional film use in China during the early 20th century. Uh, we'll be, next, we'll have Hadi Garabaji, who received his PhD in cinema studies from New York University in 2018. His archival research makes a case for the emergence of documentary diplomacy during the early history of the USIS slash Iran relations. His upcoming article on Syracuse Group's documentary diplomacy on Iran will be published in the summer issue of the journal in Cinema Media Studies. And then finally, we'll have Brett Foucauder, who is a lecturer at the University of Delaware. In 2020, he received his PhD in Literary and Cultural Studies from Carnegie Mellon University, where he wrote a dissertation titled Filmic Aesthetics and Technologies of War, Policy, and Truth in the Motion Pictures of the United States Information Agency. And I'm also really happy that we'll be joined by Carol Swain. Uh, Carol Swain is an archivist with the National Archives and Records Administration's Special Media Division and currently works on digitization and access projects. She's also served as a reference archivist for the NARA's Motion Picture Branch and has been at NARA since 2009. So I will play the video now and uh, look forward to in engaging in the Q&A with you after. Hi. I'm Nick Cull from the University of Southern California, and today I want to talk about the way in which USIA film was part of President Kennedy's initiative in Latin America, the Alliance for Progress. Um, uh, Kennedy, uh, from the beginning of his administration, announced that he was going to do more to help Latin America and uh, launch the Alliance for Progress. It's actually in the inaugural address. The idea was that he would uh, match American aid uh, with uh, aid from regional uh, governments and that they would all commit to promoting self-help to help the citizens to build a better life. Um, USIA uh, contributed the, the publicity for uh, the Alliance for Progress within the region, uh, but uh, in Washington, D.C., the Alliance had its own uh, press um, apparatus. Uh, USIA at this point was under the directorship of Edward R. Murrow. Uh, Murrow was one of the best known TV journalists at the time, and uh, it was quite a feather in USIA's cap to suddenly have a nationally known person as, as the director. Uh, the emphasis on Latin America uh, included investment in the region. USIA created what was called a regional service center. Uh, this was a, a, a um, facility in Mexico City that could print and create all kinds of public diplomacy uh, materials locally. But the films I'm talking about today were, were made in, in the United States. There, there was uh, some production in, um, in Mexico for the region, but I'm, I'm, I want to focus on the US work. Uh, USIA planned to upgrade the use of film and uh, the person in charge of that effort was uh, the son of Hollywood uh, film director George Stevens, George S. Stevens Jr. One of the first things that Stevens did 
to um, uh, help Kennedy's uh, public diplomacy for and about Latin America was to work on a series of presidential visit films. So really upgrading uh, films of, of Kennedy's visits to the region so that they had uh, well-known uh, documentary filmmakers uh, like Leo Seltzer or Charles Guggenheim working on them, that, so that they had celebrity narrators, uh, high uh, quality um, uh, production values, 35 millimeter, uh, and uh, these films would include not just stuff of the president's movements and meeting and greeting people, but they would uh, introduce the country to, to, to the world and have elements that were about the history of, of the country. Uh, these soft policy elements, as they became came to be known, uh, emphasis on the life of ordinary people and elements that look more like a um, more like a documentary film than a, a, a government promotion. Uh, these elements predominated in um, a, a couple of projects, high priority projects for USIA. Three films about uh, Colombia made by the filmmaker James Blue, commissioned by George Stevens. Um, these films were uh, Evil Wind Out, which is about the way in which a community in Colombia uh, create their own healthcare center, uh, a school for Rincon Santo about a village that builds a schoolhouse, Letter from Colombia uh, about the whole uh, work of the Alliance in general. All three of these films focus on ordinary people and use children as uh, a, a way into telling uh, the story. Blue is especially interesting in uh, Letter from Colombia because he actually includes a, a, a film within a film, a, a little parody documentary mocking the idea of uh, progress from the top down and saying that he wants to uh, tell the story from the point of view of uh, Colombians and actually admitting to the artificial elements in uh, the documentary. Uh, he narrated himself and uh, I found that this film was used worldwide, not just in Latin America, and used very effectively, for example, in India. The idea was that the US could show the world what uh, advantages could, could come from being allied to the US rather than to the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, a second soft policy film is Bridges of the Barrios, created in 1963 by the, the conservative filmmaker Bruce Hershenson. Hershenson had his roots in the US Air Force and in uh, films for the aerospace industry. He'd also worked making films for NASA. His brief for USIA was to create a film that could sell the military to Ecuador and uh, sell the idea of the military to the whole world as a useful civil development uh, resource. Hershenson decided, and he got these orders direct from Murrow, Hershenson decided to avoid a crude story of progress in the same way that Blue wanted to avoid that. And he also thought that children would be a great uh, focus for the story. But his particular, um, uh, the story that he finds in Ecuador is uh, a story of the, of the Ecuadorian military um, creating, uh, delivering water to one of the poorest neighborhoods and the way in which this has made uh, life in the barrio uh, much, uh, much, much better. The, the, the Alliance for Progress is, is mentioned only in passing. I think there's a, you see the logo uh, in one of the uh, scenes. Uh, it, 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 so it's, um, it, it's a light touch, uh, even if it's dealing with a heavy subject. And Paul Newman uh, delivered the narration, which added to the appeal of the film it, for elite audiences uh, outside the region. It was used, as I'm, I'm saying, this was also used um, world worldwide. Um, the problem is uh, that a valentine to the Ecuadorian military wasn't necessarily appropriate. Within a few months of the film being completed, they had actually perpetrated a coup and overthrown the democratic government in Ecuador. The later Kennedy years and, and the post-Kennedy period uh, see uh, an, an emphasis on um, 
creating anti-Cuban material uh, for, for Latin America. Uh, one of USIA's best projects is called Cuba, A World Verdict, which interviews journalists from around the world. And these journalists explain what's, what's gone wrong with the Cuban revolution from, the, from their point of view. USIA also includes uh, Latin American scenes in films that, that cut between many locations uh, around the world, including uh, Hershenson's film, uh, uh, Years of Lightning, Day of Drums, which is uh, the Kennedy obituary film. There's also uh, a film called Eulogy to 502 made by Hershenson, which has three sequences shot in Latin America. And James Blue's final film for USIA, A Few Notes on Our Food Problem, has some very moving scenes shot in a barrio, uh, sorry, sorry, in a favela, rather, in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, the most successful films in the region were probably not the USIA documentaries, but NASA films uh, dealing with uh, the conquest of space. Um, but uh, USIA's TV shows uh, did very well, especially a, a soap opera called Nuestro, Nuestro Barrio, uh, created in 1965, uh, which topped the uh, ratings in many of the many Latin American countries. It was originally created in Mexico. The problem is that behind the scenes, there's a political neglect of Latin American issues and a drift into simply supporting autocracy rather than working for reform. So uh, the, the phenomenon we saw in Ecuador spreads to other countries as uh, uh, Latin militaries take control. A coda to the story, George Stevens. Uh, left USIA uh, in as early as 1967 and began working at the American Film Institute. He's still alive and well and is working as a writer and producer uh, of documentaries. Uh, James Blue uh, well, left USIA and went to be a filmmaker and teacher. Uh, he died aged just 49 uh, in uh, 1980, but still has a great influence. Uh, Bruce Hershenson uh, went on to be an aide for Richard Nixon, a TV pundit. He ran unsuccessfully for the Senate and then uh, worked as a teacher, writer and Voice of America commentator uh, in, in later years. He died in uh, 2020. USIA was folded into the Department of State in 1999. So my final thoughts on this is that USIA's films uh, for Latin America, I think, deserve a second look, especially given that they were intended to promote admiration for the US outside of the region as well as inside. Uh, I think that the policy uh, issues uh, within the films are unresolved. And uh, it's interesting that Blue and Hershenson have such different political takes, uh, but also have a different political uh, remedy in the film. Hershenson is obviously a top-down uh, um, politics, whereas uh, James Blue favors a, a bottom-up. The importance of public diplomacy, however, it, you know, is, is not in the outgoing communication. It's getting the policy right. And I think in Latin America, the problem was that the underlying policy uh, was still deeply flawed. There's value in studying public diplomacy history. Uh, and I think uh, that film is a wonderful resource, especially when combined with the textual records that we have for public diplomacy. The next frontier in this kind of research is to think about reception and the reactions of the audiences in the region and around the world to these films. Thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to our discussion period. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Hong Wei Thorn Chen. I'm an assistant professor in communication at Tulane University. Uh, the title of my talk today is Projecting China in the 1940s Philanthropic Media Network. Uh, and this is part of my book project on Chinese educational film at mid-century. Uh, today, I will be discussing a number of films that I found at NARA's Harmon Foundation collection, uh, which were originally produced by the China-based University of Nanking. Uh, I show how non-theatrical film mediated by missionary and church institutions, uh, what I call a philanthropic media network, uh, note the change from the original title, uh, became a key site for the articulation of a new public image of China for the United States, 
uh, and one that can be read alongside uh, more state-oriented accounts of public diplomacy. So let me just spend the first part of my talk detailing the object that I'm discussing uh, and how I found it. Um, so the film that I'm going to be focusing on is called China Gets Her Salt. Uh, it is a, in the Harmon Foundation at NARA. Uh, the film was originally shot by Sun Mingjing uh, as a co-production between the University of Nanking uh, and the National Educational Cinematographic Society of China. Uh, I first saw this film at the China Film Archive, uh, where it was ran at two reels. Uh, there's another one reel version that I saw at the United Board of Christian Higher Education Archives of the Yale Divinity School. Uh, and that version is Chinese titled and it was uh, also cut by the uh, filmmaker. And then of course I have this version uh, at Harmon. Uh, and uh, China Gets Her Salt is an industrial process film about the production of salt uh, from Brian Wells uh, in the municipality of Zigong in Sichuan province, a region that had long been an important salt producer in Western China and which took paramount importance uh, during the war. And I'm just gonna let uh, the inner titles kind of tell you the story of this year. And these maps, uh, these animated maps are only in the Harmon Foundation version. So they were uh, introduced when the film was recut. And I want you to just remember this inner title here because I think it's important. So um, as I mentioned, uh, this film was produced by Jingling University's Department of Educational Cinematography. Uh, and this was another name for University of Nanking. Uh, Jingling was a missionary university that was governed by a board of Protestant churches in the US. Uh, but by the 1930s, it had acquired a significant degree of autonomy uh, under the nationalist government's uh, educational policies uh, and became one of the premier universities for science and engineering education in China. Uh, Salt, the SALT film is along, uh, go, comes alongside around 40 industrial process titles uh, that were produced uh, in conjunction with the NECS, a paragovernmental organization uh, founded to build the educational film sector. And here are some stills from other uh, Jingli University uh, films. Uh, these were known as industrial know-how films or Gongye uh, Chang Shi Pian. And this is another one from the film about embroidery. Uh, Jingling educational productions were shown both in the university's own classrooms as well as on the Ministry of Education's National Projection Circuit, uh, which is consisted primarily of mobile teams. Uh, so I was really quite pleasantly surprised when I found this film or something that matched this description uh, at the NARA in the NARA catalog, uh, finding aid um, uh, through really what was a random search. Uh, and I was then able to identify seven other films that were produced by the University of Nanking uh, that are in the same uh, Harmon Foundation archive. Uh, in some senses, this is not a total surprise. Uh, in 1940, Sun Mingjing uh, took a Rockefeller funded trip uh, to the United States where he visited many AD institutions and he brought several films with him, uh, films that he later donated to US institutions. Uh, and in 1946, he uh, called for the Chinese film industry to pivot to educational 16 millimeter, uh, which he thought could be marketed better on the US, US non-theatrical circuit, and hence bypassing the hegemony of Hollywood uh, in generating ardent sympathy uh, for the Chinese cause. And one of the main avenues for this distribution was the Harmon Foundation, a philanthropic institute that was established in 1922 uh, and best known for its promotion of African-American arts. Uh, in 1925, Harmon opened its Religious Motion Picture Foundation, uh, which is part of its division of visual experiment uh, that was entrusted with supplying high quality motion pictures for church services. And here are title cards from a couple of other China films that were in its collection, uh, and they were produced by a variety of different entities. Uh, and this is where the salt film is found in the catalog under uh, three different uh, headings. Um, so these are not governmental films per se. And in fact, uh, however, we can see the Harmon Foundation's China films as part of a people to people network of public diplomacy uh, before that phrase became really, you know, part of the embedded lexicon. Uh, and it was part of uh, these networks of effectivity and mediation that contributed to, uh, but were also heterogeneous from the state. And overall, I want to argue for a shift in our understanding of public diplomacy from sovereignty uh, defined by state agents 
uh, to governmentality uh, or the pervasive and heterogeneous mechanisms that govern the circulation uh, and the crafting of national images. And in the context that I'm discussing here, uh, missionary institutions and church circuits were in fact paramount. Uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, there was the, uh, the so-called modernist versus fundamentalist controversy in missionary work. Uh, with promote, proponents of the modern missionary uh, turning away from uh, conversion and towards educational and technological aid. Uh, and this was buttressed by an anthropological discourse that saw national and local cultures as structural functionalist holes uh, rather than barbaric and primitive. Uh, and in China, uh, this was pushed along by uh, you know, anti-Christian sentiment in the 1920s, as well as the nationalist government. Uh, which uh, you know really turned these missionary institutions in China towards uh, you know science and engineering uh, education. Uh, the Religious Motion Pictures Foundation um, was aligned with this modern camp, and it saw the non-theatrical film circuit as a counterpoint to Hollywood representations of Asia and Africa as primitive and barbaric. And this was done in conversation with uh, many other associations. Uh, importantly, I want to point out one, which was the China Film Enterprises of America. Uh, and this was an organization founded by Wango Wang, uh, a Chinese American art collector uh, and uh, who was trained in the US uh, at the Harmon Foundation uh, after being educated at a US uh, university. Uh, and he made a number of educational films about China, including ones about Chinese art. He was also one of the main consultants for uh, the Battle of China segment of Frank Capra's uh, training film. Uh, he was employed by the China Institute of America uh, which was founded by Chinese graduates of U.S. institutions uh, in connection with diplomatic circles. Uh, and uh, this organization supported Chinese international students in the United States uh, amid anti-Asian sentiment and also uh, was in charge of um, mediating a kind of national respectability politics, uh, one that uh, presented China as a modernizing nation, uh, but one that was in the image of the United States. And here's um, just a, a quick example from a film by the director of the Institute, which uh, literally superimposes the United States on China uh, and also reads, uh, you know, modern Chinese women in the image of uh, their American sisters. And this is an image from a department store uh, in Shanghai. So uh, the salt film fits very strangely in this dynamic, uh, largely because uh, it did not depict Chinese modernization in the image of the United States. So the salt wells were uh, a mixed industrial site making use of multiple uh, modalities of construction materials as well as power. Uh, and uh, note how these inner titles in the Harmon Foundation cut emphasizes you know, the lack of these modern materials and methods uh, but rather ingenuity and age old methods. Uh, and uh, I think this is interesting if we compare it to the original cut of the film or the UBCHEA cut uh, that actually shows, for example, uh, you know, this coal powered steam engine bringing uh, brine to the surface. Uh, and then, um, uh, and I'm gonna just skip a bit because I'm running out of time. And then later shows, uh, you know, uh, oxen or water buffalo uh, being used to uh, raise brine up to uh, the derrick. And uh, these are, of course, industrial process images that follow the kind of kinetic energy uh, that, is being, uh, that is being generated. Um, in the Harmon Foundation version, there's an emphasis on um, the lack of these modern methods. Uh, it's actually recut, everything is reordered, uh, in part to create a more dra dramatic kind of uh, kinetic effect. Uh, but in, uh, in other parts to uh, really sideline uh, the mixed industrial modalities and to put the emphasis on uh, this kind of Chinese age old uh, um, uh, ingenuity. So see how these images are put uh, entirely out of order uh, compared to the uh, original film. And uh, you see how these images uh, are put over here. Uh, so um, Salome Saversky argues that uh, processual representation needs to be thought in terms of and in conjunction with theories of cultural evolutionism. And we can see how in the multiple cuts of this film, uh, we have a recrafting of the temporality of process in order to fit a very particular developmentalist syntax. Uh, and in conclusion, um, mapping the circulation of Zugung salt wells uh, via these Protestant philanthropic networks 
undercovers multiple levels of mediation. It allows us to better understand the production of China as an object of cultural understanding. And moreover, the multiple versions of this film show us the contested imaginary of national culture and development across uh, this network of public diplomacy. Thank you. The clip that we just saw is the introductory logo of Akhbar Iran, Iran News Series. I am Hadi Garabaghi, an adjunct assistant professor at Drew University, and I'm going to speak about this news series. Over 300 episodes of Iran News have recently become available online as high quality digital videos for viewing, download, and research on the website of National Archives and Records Administration. Iran News was the first nationally distributed local newsreel in Iran and ran from 1954 to 1962. Running between seven to 10 minutes, these weekly newsreels often included three local news segments and one to three news reports from around the world. While a binational team of Iranians and Americans supervised the commentaries, and offered infrastructural support, a majority of the production was completed entirely by Iranians. Iran News was screened both in movie theaters, before feature films, and via mobile trucks equipped with projectors. Through Iran News, Iranians became gradually used to the format of a news reportage that spoke to them in person. These publicly funded newsreels were sponsored by people who did not speak the language of the voiceover, however. It was the early Cold War and justification for funding was Soviet containment. United States government approached countries with invitational packages of monetary aid and technical assistance, and in turn, countries accepted and formed by national governing groups to build institutions of media governance and public training. This was how the early Cold War warriors approached the crisis of liberal governance. As the official diplomacy mediating the emerging ideological conflict became increasingly strained, media diplomacy proliferated through binational and multinational groups working together through uneven chains of bureaucracy and personal contact. Characteristic of a messy rationality, sometimes public health programs, geopolitical publicity, and anti-Soviet propaganda shared objectives and operated contiguously and concomitantly. Today, Iran news segments offer a rare access to perhaps the least represented and most formative post-war Iran of the 50s through heavy voiceover of mid-century newsreel format. Historically, Iran news episodes show a country whose democratic government of Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh had recently been overthrown by a coup d'etat orchestrated through the collusion between the intelligence agencies of a dying empire and an emerging one. Punishing the country for nationalizing its oil fields and fearing communist influence, Iran became subject to severe economic sanctions before the coup. Furthermore, US government waited until the coup was complete to release the monetary aid Iran desperately needed for modernization. The aftermath of the coup, therefore, set in motion a period of rapid modernization, which is fully evident in Iran news series. Metaphorically speaking, a smiley face stretches over military training, policing, public management, institutions of social service, higher education, arts, and sport. 
The voice image combination in these scenes is uncannily reminder of the documentaries of the New, New Deal era. Positivist images of activist activities organized by an official and often cheerful male voiceover, however, switches to a threatening tone when reporting confiscation of leftist press, booklet burning, Iranian refugees returning from Soviet Union, warnings against listening to Soviet communist radio, and during a few compilation episodes of misrepresenting the 1953 coup as a day when people came to the street and demanded Shah's return. Those people were paid by CIA and MI6 and led by a street talk named Shabon Jafari, who also appears in one episode of cultural reportage in Iran news, featuring performances in a Zurkhane, the space designating the traditional system of athletics in Iran. I interviewed Muhammad Ali Isari, the key person responsible for planning and production of Iran news in his residence in California in 2007, shortly before he passed away. Isari spoke little. He occasionally remembered names and stories while watching a few Iran news segments with me. Back in early 1950s, Isari worked as an Iranian liaison first with British Center, and then with the US, USRS office in Iran. Isari fully supported Iranian monarchy and played a key role in bringing images of the Shah and his family to the weekly attention of Iranians. In scenes of royal family inaugurating a factory, a dam, a hospital, the sport event, or attending official diplomatic visits, trips, or during scenes of villagers paying respect by kissing Shah's hand for returning to them some share of the lands which Shah's father, Reza Shah, had initially claimed by force. Isari learned the craft of newsreel production through working with the documentary crew associated with Syracuse Group, contracted by the USIA in Iran. Isari emerged as the authority mediating by national contract bureaucratically while facilitating the growth of documentary knowledge, production, and training, as well as the institutionalization of a central organization of media governance. The objective was fostering the growth of public administration, military and policing, as well as arts and culture while suppressing leftist dissent. Isari's vision of Iran news, therefore, aligned very well with the USIS policy of promoting local news magazines as a means of both publicizing the geopolitically reasoned goodwill gesture of US government in Iranian modernization and a darker propaganda tactic of demonizing communists and scaring Iranians from supporting them. Scenes of American officials visiting Iran and paternalistic mentions of American monetary, military, and technical support, therefore, pervade Iran news segments. The messy Cold War rationality behind the production of Iran news continues to shape its discourse today. Pro-monarchy media diplomacy platforms such, such as Manoto have been posting Iran news episodes on social media regularly, for an example, as nostalgic images of democratic Iran. These social media publications never mention anything about the USIS, of course. Dated as it has become, the official male and accent-free voiceover in Iran news feels both familiar and alien today. Sometimes we can recognize echoes of its outrageous sexism, propaganda threat, and funny references in documentaries appearing on Iranian television. Moreover, Iran news stands out today as an archival evidence of the messy rationality of the early Cold War group of governing planners who infantilized 
the economically impoverished nations and stepped into racist footprint of British Empire in the region. Who would put a knife into someone's back while reaching out for help at one's presence and expecting a handshake? What happened to this post-war American governing generation whose logic of genuine diplomacy and treacherous betrayal could align seamlessly as two sides of a coin? Iran news series is now with us as the evidence of a nation just betrayed and it stays with us to ponder. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brett Vakoda from the University of Delaware. My presentation today is titled Solidarity Through Satellite, USICA's Global Broadcast of Let Poland Be Poland. Though the US Information Agency produced or distributed roughly 20,000 movie image titles over its 46 year run, the 1982 television spectacle, Let Poland Be Poland, represents a unique artifact within the archive. Its strange aesthetic and tonal hybridity, falling somewhere between telethon, documentary, and award show, reflects the liminal moment from which it emerged in the USIA's history. On the crest of a reactivated Cold War, new capabilities in satellite television, and a vast shift in the culture of agency leadership, Let Poland Be Poland both reflects this transitional moment and presupposes forces that were to shape USIA media in the coming years. The ostensible impetus behind Let Poland Be Poland was to build international support for the Polish Solidarity Movement, a nationwide workers' union that emerged in response to flattening wages, rising food costs, and poor working conditions. With Solidarity's membership peaking at 10 million in late 1981, provoking Soviet-friendly leaders to declare martial law, the movement reached a boiling point. In the, Americans, in the American agency's brash new director, Charles Wick, saw his opportunity to make a splash on the global stage. In what became the most expensive production in the USIA's history, Wick gathered 23 world leaders, Polish artists and activists, and a slew of Hollywood celebrities to project a multinational consensus behind the workers' union broadcasting Let Poland Be Poland live across television and radio to 46 countries in 39 languages. When Ronald Reagan nominated Wick, his close friend from Hollywood, to run the agency in 1981, he inherited Jimmy Carter's U.S. International Communications Agency, or USICA. In the wake of the agency's often hardline approach to the Vietnam War, President Carter reorganizes and re reorganized and rebranded the office to reflect what he called the second mandate which called for USICA to not only tell America's story, but also welcome the stories of other cultures into its own, prioritizing a much more dialogic approach to public diplomacy initiatives. Reagan and Wick reeled back Carter's reforms though, even changing the agency's name back to the USIA in late 1982. Compared to the previous administration, Wick and Reagan favored an agency model that reamplified Manichaean, bipolar, and globally rendered frameworks similar to those employed in the USIA's early years. In looking where to make its first mark, the research wing of Wix USIA highlighted general unrest in Poland with wide support for solidarity, which sought to effect, quote, great changes in the social order. The situation in Poland offered an apt opportunity through which to return to the political sensibilities of the early Cold War. During the USIA's first two decades, images from such events like the resistance fighting in East Germany, the Hungarian uprising of 1956, and the Prague Spring in 1968 to find the Cold War writ large in the American imaginary. In that tradition, Wick believed he could productively disseminate scenes of the Polish workers' resistance, leveraging them towards anti-Soviet sentiment. In line with another approach of the early USIA, the agency could also resituate conceits employed by the Soviets, rendering the leftist ideal of workers' solidarity into vague expressions of liberty and sovereignty. Relative to these earlier events, though, Wick had more tools at his disposal. With new satellite technologies, he could coordinate a live global broadcast to premiere immediately after an international series of rallies backing solidarity, using footage of the rallies within the broadcast to further underscore the immediacy of the stakes. It could be a profound television and radio event collectively experienced throughout the world. During Let Poland Be Poland's development, we aggressively hyped the program and sought to maximize its reach, attaching famous names from politics and show business, creating a network of private funding, and ensuring the program would be broadcast to as many televisions and radios as possible. First, he looked to Hollywood for a director that could strike an effective balance between spectacle and solemnity within a satellite event. He hired Marty Pacetta, who had, ex who had experienced directing shows like the Academy Awards and the Grammys. Next, he and the agency somehow recruited an assortment of 23 political leaders from around the world, several Hollywood stars, Polish artists and activists, and even the leader of the AFL-CIO AFL to participate in the program. 
As the program gathered more firepower, early estimates put the budget uh, as high as 700,000, nearly half a million more than the agency's second most expensive production, the 1971 Vietnam Vietnam. While nearly all of the show's participants offered their services for free, the high production value, translation fees, and cost of satellite distribution ballooned the budget. True to the administration's ethos, though, Wick found outside money to fund his spectacle. He recruited organizations like the Heritage Foundation and the U.S. Tobacco Company, along with individual donors, to back the program. And as a boon to Wick's efforts, Congress declared January 30th as an official day of solidarity with the Polish people and opened up the domestic dis dissemination of the show to 297 local PBS stations across the U.S., which would have typically, which would have typically been prohibited per the smith munt Act. Let Poland Be Poland premiered on January 31st, 1982. Its strange combination of spectacle, celebrity, and solemnity has the feel of an international telethon with the glamour and editing style of an awards show, resulting in a somewhat surreal 90-minute television event. The description of the opening sequence within the program script previews the pathos-laden tone and general aesthetic of the show. The program again says the script describes with, quote, images of normal everyday life before the imposition of martial law which are later drained of color and replaced by black and white shots of the recent events in Poland. Following a fade to black quote, we hear the voice of Charlton Heston speaking from the darkness. And after he let, literally lights a candle for the Polish people, Heston reflects, quote, solidarity. This program itself is a display of solidarity. It is a gathering place for people and ideas from all over the world collected by satellite, demonstrating that freedom speaks in many tongues, but one voice. In addition to Heston, two other MCs lead the viewers through four different elements interwoven throughout the program. First, Heston takes us through a historic assemblage of political figures claiming, quote, never before has such an array of world leaders gathered together under one electronic umbrella. Heads of state such as the UK's Margaret Thatcher, Francis Francois Mitterrand, and Iceland's Gunnar Thordsen express their support of Polish solidarity in recorded 90 second speeches. Second, actress Glenda Jackson with a dynamic digital map behind her points our attention to rallies occurring throughout the world on the Day of Solidarity, using on-the-ground footage to give evidentiary weight to the theme of global consensus. Third, actor Max, Max von Sydow de details the history behind the Solidarity Movement, introducing segments featuring talented Pol Polish artists and dedicated activists, which in many critics' views became the highlight of the program. Fourth, a variety of scenes featuring American celebrities such as Bob Hope explaining radio jamming, Frank Sinatra singing Everett Homework, and Henry Fonda giving an ironic reading of Frederick Engels uh, serve as interludes throughout the show, often under undercutting the more earnest tone uh, throughout much uh, of the rest of the program. Although Wick promised nearly 300 million viewers, more reasonable guesses estimate 100 million people tuned in to Let Poland Be Poland. Following the program's premiere, critics' reactions were mixed, many questioning what exactly it was they just watched. Time Magazine labeled it as, quote, a singular crossbeat of doc documentary and a star-studded entertainment politics and theatrical pizzazz. The Christian Science Monitor called it, quote, worthwhile as propaganda, though dull and sometimes repetitive. Reviews outside of the US were generally more negative, such as one in the London Daily Mails, which argued, quote, only in the United States would such a vulgar spectacle be mounted. And the Soviet news agency, TASS, uh, expectantly went further, calling it, quote, a provocative act of telesubversion. As Wick's tenure as USI director continued throughout the whole of Reagan's presidency, Let Poland Be Poland seemed to presuppose key, three key trends uh, that came to inform agency and media through the, throughout the 1980s. One, for much of Reagan's term, the more widely disseminate USIA films and programs, such as those covering the Soviet-Afghan war, reflected the rhetorical tone of Let Poland Be Poland, pigeonholing complex geopolitics into reductive good versus evil binaries that underscored Reagan's reamplification of the Cold War. Two. As the funding model behind the program foreshadowed, private and partisan interests had more means to influence agency operations, which often came in tension with agency officials still upholding Carter's second mandate. And three, and most importantly, let Poland be Poland, though very imperfectly, establish proof of concept for the agency's investment in televisual technologies. In late 1983, the USIA launched its, the, its first live World Net press conference to mitigate the fallout of the US invasion of Grenada allowing journalists throughout the world to speak directly to leaders like Gene Kirkpatrick. What was originally a specific type of program, WorldNet later became the USIA's brand to what many identify as the first true global satellite network. In the late 1980s and into the 1990s, WorldNet offered a prolific and diverse programming output. However, none of it ever quite matched the strange hybridity of Let Poland Be Poland. Thank you.
Thank you so much for those well, wonderful presentations. Um, so I'm going to start with a kind of a broad question, and then we can uh, go in. And again, you can ask questions uh, via the Q and A. And so this comes from uh, someone uh, who posted. Uh, one question I have is, what makes a film a tool of public diplomacy versus a propaganda film? Does it depend on who we ask and how our values align with the, those portrayed in the given film? Or is there something more fundamental that distinguishes the two? And so I think I'd be interested actually in hearing from all four presenters on that question. Uh, Martin, if I can um, start off with this one. Um... You know, I've <laughs> I spent my life thinking and talking about public diplomacy, and to be honest, the term began as a euphemism. The United States wanted to be able to say, we virtuous Americans do public diplomacy, those wicked communists do propaganda. And uh, it was because of the negative um, associations of the word propaganda that the United States looked for a different um, empty, uh, benign term that they could fill up with good meanings. But once the term was in existence, then the practitioners filled it with the meanings they wanted. And, you know, in the years since it was coined, it's coined around 1965 by the US government uh, or for the US government, um, it, it's come to emphasize dialogue, exchange, uh, openness to learning and, and a kind of a two-way process. And so uh, part of the question would be, can, can we see uh, films as being opening to a two-way process, opening to a learning process, or is the film just about getting to yes, just about bullying the audience into taking the point of view that the filmmaker um, uh, wants? And um, it, it, it may be that sometimes the uh, a two-way process is adopted as a kind of uh, rhetorical strategy. Um, and uh, arguably, the soft policy films from the George Stevens era, uh, they're, they're there to advance policy, even if they take a kind of a dialogue, uh, an openness to learn uh, as, as part of the re rhetoric of the film. I wouldn't put up any um, fight if somebody said, all those films were uh, were, were propaganda, uh, as long as it's you know propaganda in the sense of yeah sure they're one way communication uh, in, intended to 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 make a policy point. But I'd be interested to know what my colleagues uh, make of that. Can I follow? Yes, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, excellent question. I mean, in the course of my work, um, I also noticed that um, doing my research, when I use these terminologies, phrases, public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, I noticed I have to do something with them because people are still writing about public diplomacy in the contemporary context. People are still writing about cultural diplomacy in the contemporary context. And I started, okay, I'm going to call this weaponized cultural diplomacy in the context of what I was doing, because that's not the same. Practices cannot be just collapsed onto each other. Same experience I felt with public. And, you know, both of these categories, public and cultural, also have a very rich and contested um, theoretical, philosophical underpinning. Public start with uh, Hannah Arendt, we have Habermas, we have Foucault himself, you know, the whole thing that goes around, uh, including the liberal conceptualization of public. So what I suggest here is that for us to be film and media scholars, to, to, to allow for the ideological variations and the kind of potency and complexity, we just describe the media that becomes the, 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 the means and mediating means of uh, exchange. And then it brings people together, no matter, even if it's, if, if, if even it's categorizing that propaganda I referred of a book burning, it's still people come together, create certain negotiations together to make that. That culture, that relations are extremely important to me. So I would call it, television diplomacy, newsreel diplomacy, documentary diplomacy, because it allows all other kind of, uh, allow us to think through it. And, uh, and uh, 
I would think maybe maybe a kind of a way for us to de-emphasize propaganda as a kind of a, uh, um, it's a, it's that phrase that is sitting behind and the listening it does it reduces the <laughs> we're all trying so hard to make our audiences and people to become cognizant of a complexity involved in how United States you know people go in among of other cultures and create a meaningful conversation at the time that people talking about atomic explosions here there this was a addressing liberal um crisis crisis of liberal governing that's how our grandpas grandmas did it now we look back at them and there's, there's something to learn to my suggestion that if we look at it from this perspective Thorne, yes um Thanks. That's a yeah. That's a very interesting question, and uh, I entirely agree with both of these responses. Um, the I guess two things I want to add. One of them is that uh, I do think that uh, once, even as public diplomacy is a euphemism for propaganda, uh, once that term gets coined, uh, there are a whole series of norms that then emerge around it, uh, and institutional practices that uh, then uh, you know. There's a, there's a way in which you do public diplomacy. How do you differentiate this from propaganda? How do you prevent other people from pointing the finger at you and saying that this is also propaganda? And so then pu public diplomacy suddenly has an institutional uh, and practical reality, right? Uh, I think in, in the context that I work in, it's, this is particularly interesting. Um, so the word propaganda never really became a bad word in China, Shen Chuang, uh, up until uh, relatively recently. Uh, I think it was just uh, very recently um, that uh, they started uh, in official publications translating, when they translate them into English, uh, translating Shen Chuang into publicity instead of propaganda. Uh, very, very smart, uh, you know, public diplomatic move, uh, so to speak. Um, I think, you know, the, uh, for, for the archive that I'm looking at, um, there was, uh, we, we should think of um, the idea of public diplomacy in, in relation to a series of other terms. Uh, that give it uh, some more weight uh, because it wasn't it was actually not a word that was used in the 1930s uh, by you know the folks that I'm, I'm looking at um, but rather uh, you know the the word uh, was in fact in Chinese at least propaganda uh, so propaganda was for ex for was was external uh, so when so these films when they were shown internally people said that this was about education uh, internally in China uh, and then when they were shown uh, to the world, uh, that was termed propaganda. So that suddenly that becomes a, a, another distinction that emerges. Uh, and I think in the US, I mean, the word that the key word here is goodwill, right? We want the goodwill of the American people for the Chinese cause. Uh, and so that uh, I think, you know, is connected in other ways to uh, I think missionary discourses uh, and, and a variety of different, uh, you know, other, other key words as well. And Brett, yeah, I don't have too much to add. I think uh, my colleagues expressed kind of the difference between public diplomacy, the difference and similarities between these two concepts quite well. I maybe go. The one thing I'd add is that even through the 1980s, we do see the word propaganda within the U.S. context still used within particular professional discursive spaces. Charles Wick comfortably used the words, for example, at like communications conferences. He would refer to WorldNet, um, the, the satellite network that I talked about in my presentation, as the quote, the greatest device uh, for propaganda the U.S. I ever employed. So they didn't necessarily steer away from the word. And I think there's a cognizance of the power of that word, but kind of in terms of professionalization, institutionalization, public diplomacy, for people working within the agency and for their marketing of the agency uh, was much more palatable. That was my one addition to the excellent responses by my colleagues. Yeah, great. So yeah, I think I'll switch. Uh, there's a great question about thinking about paratext, text that has accompanied these films. So I'll read this. So in the educational context, films are often accompanied by pamphlets, discussion guides, or instructions on how to stage debates. Uh, did any of these films arrive with similar paratext or presentation strategies? One thing we'll be talking about tomorrow is paper records associated with films held by the National Archives. But curious in your own research, how that textual material kind of shapes how these films might've been received or gives us information about how they were presented to audiences. Some of these films were part of overall campaigns. So for example, USIA would have an Atoms for Peace exhibition. They'd have Atoms for Peace uh, press releases and they'd have a documentary film 
tied into it. So uh, that you know, you have atoms for peace, the leaflet, atoms for peace, the documentary, uh, atoms for peace, uh, the the um, uh, whatever you know, multiple uh, speeches and 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 so forth. The one that had the biggest that I'm aware of that had the biggest uh, collateral around it was the Kennedy obituary film. Years of Lightning, Day of Drums, where they 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 turned the film into an event. Uh, typically, the embassy would be involved, and it would even be a a, a a ritual to go and see the film to remember the president. It would be built into a kind of a a ceremony of mourning, and um, there's a lot to be that you can uh, put together about that particular um, that particular film. That's the one that springs to mind, but it's a great question. Yeah, I just have a quick comment on that, that uh, a lot of the times where there is a campaign like Adams for Peace, you might find material in motion pictures, this is at the archives, um, but also in still pictures and textual documents and also at presidential libraries. So oftentimes it's not just one, you have to look in several different areas. I can add to it as well. I mean, I did show posters in my presentation that um, so it, you know, basically they were advertising these newsreels. Uh, beyond that, in, for the training films that were done in early 1950s, it was different. And for those, they had questionnaires would go around. And then uh, oftentimes they would have the screening if they would, went to villagers. And then they would bring people in a cafe. And then they would distribute questions and have sit down and have a tea and ask questions about And this would involve oftentimes agricultural um, uh, films. If it was about childbirth and that kind of conversation, they would bring women together and start having questions, you know, discussions would be, and uh, sometimes even there were activities involved with that. Okay, after watching the film, we're gonna go do this activity, maybe workshop that. The agricultural modernization was a very, um, 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 extensively involved and embedded within point four, which is the US aid program. It, this, this were, and, and you know, um, they had a success rate in Iran and all this conversation can be verified and research more, et cetera, building wells, you know, um, preventing malaria, this, this, it, it was very extensive, you know? Yeah. If, if I can add, um... I'd point a lot of people, I'd point you to um, a particular film from 1951 uh, called New Eyes, New Year. So it's produced by SCAP CIE in Japan. Uh, I defer to Yuka Sushia, who's gonna be presenting later today to talk a little bit more about this. But within that film, you actually see kind of this process of teaching films codified into its own sort of pedagogy. They give a step-by-step -step process of how someone can rent a film from a USIS library, take it to the particular location, the particular community, the club, and kind of, teach the film. They, they teach kind of the process by which to foster discussion. Um, and this is something that's hung around through today. Um, if you look on the State Department's website, for example, you still have discussion guides for Hollywood films, documentary films, PBS documentaries, um, in places like American Corners, American Spaces, which still operate probably in over like 250 locations throughout the world. So there's even kind of like a, a so, kind of a pedagogy that is taught by these institutions like the State Department and the USIA for people to employ themselves. It's, 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 a, it's a thing that goes right back in, in, in film. I mean, it was funny, nice to see George Stevens yesterday when I was working on, on some of his dad's films, I found that um, when they released Gunga Din uh, as a, you know, RKO feature film, they had, supporting teaching material so that teachers could teach the history of India based on uh, what was in the movie Ganga Din. Now that's like re re releasing uh, stuff about the life of gorillas to accompany the release of King Kong. You know, it's completely uh, crazy, but it goes right the way down. And, and I found I'm always running into this stuff. Uh, Champion the Wonder Horse was released with material to help people teach classes on the American West. So, you know, for decades and decades, Hollywood is is uh, positioning itself to try and, oh yeah, we're gonna use those teachers to be the marketers for for our, 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 our output. And, and that's, a, um, I'm sure there are people out there, you know, doing, great stuff working on that collateral material. Um, I want to just add that the trans, uh, the translational and or transcultural context of the film, uh, of the film, film Salt that I'm dealing with has an interesting story with in terms of the paratext. So uh, 
yeah, there was there were teaching guide there was a teaching guide and lecture script uh, in Chinese from the original film. Uh, when Sun Ming Jing came to the U.S., uh, he wrote an English language script that uh, was doing something quite different. It did th things like compare the image of the salt derricks to uh, the oil derricks in Pittsburgh, things like that. He wanted that to get recorded onto uh, gramophone records to be circulated with the films. I have not actually found any um, evidence that that actually happened or that that came with these Harmon Foundation films that got circulated. Great. I think I'll move on. Um, this is a kind of could be a fun question. If there's particular films that uh, were very popular, you've kind of discovered in your research that you haven't been able to locate yet. So is there a London After Midnight version of a USA film? Uh, kind of what, what is the kind of relationship between that textual research and then trying to find films or even the right copy? I was really like Thorne's kind of mentioned multiple copies of a film, which looked very different depending on which one you encountered first. Well, I've, I've for years wanted to see the um, propaganda soap opera, Nuestro Barrio, that is now in the National Archives and accessible. So it's like, uh, I, I, you know, if, if only it wasn't for COVID, I'd be on the plane watching the uh, those those old episodes. It's so exciting that that's that that's uh, re resurfaced. Um, uh, the, the main one that I'd like to see is a thing called um, a blueprint of terror, which they was made uh, very, very widely shown around the world to explain how Cuba was trying to export uh, sabotage around Latin America. But you know, I know that was was on TV in India. It's, it, it it went very, very uh, widely, uh, and was uh, it was all explained to Congress how important this film is. So we have that congressional testimony about the significance of this, that film. But I haven't been able to I haven't been able to see it. As far as I know, there's nothing quite on the scale of Let Poland Be Poland. Um, similar productions like Night of the Dragon in the 1970s, Vietnam, Vietnam, which, which were all kind of big budget productions uh, on behalf of the USIA that is kind of hidden from the archive right now. Um, though there are a series of productions made under the umbrella of JustBow, the Joint United States uh, uh, Public Affairs Office, uh, which was kind of a conglomeration of agencies that was run by the USIA during uh, the Vietnam War. Um, within some internal memorandum, you see Miriam Bucher, uh, who was a filmmaker herself, um, but also trained filmmakers in South Vietnam. You see citations of a lot of films that appear nowhere in any of the catalogs, at least that I've seen, probably at least 15 of those. And if you look to that period, there, a lot of these films are quite good, uh, namely like the Ragdoll, um, made with a lot of kind of Vietnamese artists, Vietnamese creatives. So I'd be really curious to look at those, but I think a really interesting question too, is not necessarily are there films that were missing, but are there films that had the USIA's involvement uh, that we're not quite sure about? So in that sense, like the paper trail is really gonna kind of point us to really some new insights. Like to what extent was USIA involved in certain documentaries that circulated uh, throughout the world? Uh, certain uh, national productions. I know, for example, they were involved in some productions in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So I think the paper trail is gonna really kind of uh, highlight their involvement uh, they're unattributed involvement in a lot of other productions outside of the agency too. And, and things that were made at the regional production centers that, were, that didn't end up back in DC for, um, for archival purposes, you know, that, there's got to be some treasures, uh, treasures out there, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we're still working and we've got a wonderful archivist, Mike uh, Taylor, who's working on uh, the USIA collection. So, I mean, it's not completely processed yet, believe it or not. I mean, there's many, many series. In, involved, including the general series. So um, there could be still treasures yet to be uncovered. Absolutely. I mean, um, I'm very happy just 400 episodes have been released. This is like incredible. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the early training films, the village training films that I'm just dying to watch, I have a feeling that they haven't been processed yet. So I'm going to put a request for them. They're sitting in National Archives in Iran. So there is a documentary team went there and uh, made a documentary, has made a documentary about those films, I helped them with documentation, et cetera. I haven't heard back from them, but maybe nine months or so. It's just a, such a um, archival fever I have for those. Um, and they were um, uh, translated commentaries into Urdu, Spanish, Arabic and were sent to other places. So these are agricultural films. Um, 
And then also mentioning Bojan Nasruddin series. I was looking for that for almost eight years. And then I'm also so happy, very happy person to, as it comes to my end and always striving for more. Yes. Great, I have uh, questions for Brett. Uh, so first, just if you could say a bit more about the production process of the parts of the film that was made in Poland. And then it's kind of a way to expand that as uh, someone wrote, uh, did the broadcast leverage the relative novelty of the satellite technology as part of its meeting? So could we see satellite technology as a technological outgrowth of solidarity itself? So a small question and a big question for you. Yeah, um, great question. Uh, so as far as I know, pretty much all of the program was shot um, in Hollywood or in probably domestically, likely in Hollywood uh, in a studio. Um, many of the Polish uh, activists, the Polish artists were expatriates. Um, so they were living in the United States at the time. Um, so that's where they, uh, but if they did use image, when they did use images from Poland, much of the footage would have been captured during uh, the resistance in Gdansk in like 1976, 1977. And they just repurposed a lot of those images, much like they did with the Why We Fight series um, during World War II. Um, so, but the, the images on the ground of the Day of Solidarity, those would have been likely captured by satellite uh, post um, of the USIS um, to kind of conglomerate it into this, again, this kind of satellite display of uh, consensus and solidarity. Um, and as far as I know, it, it's, it's a bit tricky to kind of trace the history of the usage of satellite uh, within this period of the USIA. WIC certainly marketed it more than any previous people associated with the USIA. He really sold it. He sold it to the newspapers. He sold it to trade journals. Um, he hyped up the audience numbers uh, before the production too. He said, we're gonna have 300 million people watching this. It was probably more like hundred million or even a little bit less. Um, but I do know within some interviews uh, within the uh, Frontline Diplomacy Collection uh, uh, put out of the, by the State Department that they did have satellite broadcasts as far back as the mid 1970s. Some people were even frustrated that Wick took credit and Alvin Snyder, the director of the Motion Picture Division took credit for satellite, um, but like Salute by Satellite, um, which I haven't had the privilege to watch, um, during the bicentennial was one of these instances of a global broadcast. It's just Wick, who was by all accounts, a hustler and a charlatan, charlatan sold this as the first instance of like really kind of true, like a, the electronic umbrella to use Charlton Heston's word. Um, and it really did like, like not long after this, um, a former RAF agent, Alan Simpson, covertly uh, some say put satellites on top of uh, like two, 125 embassies throughout the world. And that's why a lot of people look to this, uh, like the television historian Shalaby, for example, as it's the, fir the first instance of a true global satellite network, even though it was done illegally in some cases, even in the USSR and China at that point, they installed satellites uh, covertly. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but. Uh, that, that's great. Uh, so I have a question for Thorne. I'll try to combine a couple. Uh, so first, is it correct to understand that the films produced by the University of Nanking is having been made with an eye toward gaining more military economic support for China, or is that beyond their intent? And then kind of going on to thinking about the Department of Educational Cinematography, was that part of a film school, if there was a film school, and did that have any relationship to uh, motion picture equipment manufacturing uh, in the same kind of lo location? So three combined questions. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the first question, uh, so I think that there, there were both international and local uh, demands that shaped the original production of these films. Uh, I think the primary aim of the educational film production was in fact uh, for education, for uh, mass education purposes uh, in China. Uh, and that's the reason why they were commissioned by the uh, Ministry of Education and the National Educational Cinematographic Society uh, but there was uh, definitely an understanding that these films would also be able to promote uh, China's image abroad. Uh, and I think that once we get to how these films ended up being circulated uh, in the United States, uh, with Sun Mingjing's visit to the United States, then uh, we have a lot of uh, very explicit kind of, um, you know, discussion about how these films are specifically about promoting the, the uh, U.S. support of the Chinese war effort uh, going into the 1940s. Uh, so the, what's interesting about the uh, context of these film, the film production is that uh, these films were produced out of the Department of Educational Cinematography, which was part of the School of the Sciences. Most of the people were engineers uh, and chemistry professors. Uh, so so it's, it's people who are not actually trained uh, in cinema as an art, but people who had uh, competency in uh, the scientific and technical knowledges 
uh, necessary for, uh, you know, kind of understanding the, you know, operating camera equipment, as well as, uh, in some cases, you know, producing equipment uh, and producing, um, you know, uh, uh, raw, raw film stock. Uh, I actually don't know uh, the answer to the question about um, the, non, uh, the Nanking or the Nanjing kind of optical factories. Uh, I would actually, you know, I'm curious because I'd like to kind of know what what exactly uh, what what this factory was called because I know that there were a lot of um, you know film equipment uh, manufacturers that were being uh, built in the post-war era uh, and sometimes sponsored by the state. Um, but um, I think you know probably there are precursor industries that uh, enable this as well. But that that's something that I would definitely want to look into. Thank you. I think in a broader question about celebrity uh, and because we have a model right where from World War II, if not earlier, in which Hollywood kind of lends its talent uh, as a way to kind of uh, lend a technical and kind of a star support. But then it seems to be continuing to go on, even if these celebrities are less valuable. So how many would have seen Henry Fonda and thought, oh, here's someone I remember from movies of the 40s in 1980. Uh, likewise, we're thinking of of various other kind of instances. So do you sense that the celebrity mattered to audiences or how was that kind of read in these films or is it more just the appearance of someone and the assumption is that the star is already known and doesn't need to be identified as such? Well, I think that with regard to the um, US, uh, in, the, in the George Stevens era, USIA seeks out celebrity narrators for films. So getting Paul Newman to narrate the uh, Bridges, uh, Bridges of the Barrios is important to publicizing the film, but it also suggests that the English language print is a prestige object which is going around the world. Uh, Hershenson also seeks out foreign language narrators who are known and celebrities. So especially in Years of Lightning, Day of Drums, they have um, uh, Carlo Montalban, Ricardo Montalban's brother does the, uh, does the, the, the Latin version. Um, uh, Maximilian Schell does the German version. Uh, so the, 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 they're using um, celebrity narrators to show the prestige of the, of the object. Uh, regarding Let Poland Be Poland, yet yeah, these are internationally known celebrities. It was quite important to have Glenda Jackson in there as a, a, a British star, to have um, a Max von Sydow there as a Swede. Um, was part of the, it was part of the global nature of the uh, of the product so that people were known all around the world. One piece of trivia, I looked through the accounts of, um, of um, uh, uh, Let Poland Be Poland, and the only people who demanded to be paid were ABBA, who did her like a, a 30 second spot, but said, hey, we're ABBA and we want Poland to be, they said, no, ABBA never worked for free. Uh, you, 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 you know, we don't care about, you know, sure we want Poland to be free, but, uh, ABBA don't work for free. So, uh, um, but th I think there was, there, there's an attempt to articulate a global um, uh, vocabulary of celebrity. And the State Department still does this and sometimes they get it wrong. They, they send somebody who's a celebrity in the US overseas and people know nothing at all about them. Like they send a baseball star to a non-baseball country uh, and, it, and it, it falls flat, but, um, it, it's, uh, I, I think, that, that, well, there is a whole discipline of celebrity diplomacy studies. So um, uh, it's, yeah. it, it's a whole subfield. If I can riff off, uh, riff off you, Nick, I, I agree that I think the usage of Glenda Jackson in Max Bad-Sida was very, very deliberate. Um, and honestly, it, it, in all frankness, uh, um, Charlton Heston's, Jackson's, and Von Sydow's portions are perhaps the most well composed, the most well done within the program. Um, but you see older celebrities. Um, uh, Orson Welles, Orson uh, Welles against Henry Welles. Fonda, um, Dunn, Frank right? Sinatra. No Man is an Island, right? Yeah, he reads, yeah, the John Donne poem, um, uh, For Whom the Bell Toll. Yeah, he quotes the For Whom the Bell Toll. Yeah, so it's, and he does it in the most Orson Welles way yes, possible, right. right? He just reads it slow. He stares right into the camera. He's dressed in all black, really kind of like living up his kind of master thespian persona, right? <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's, so it's, but it's interesting. It's in a lot of ways, the usage of those celebrities reflects uh, the training and the background of Wick and Reagan together. They met one another in 1959 in Hollywood. 
And a lot of people define Reagan's presidency right through like a pop nostalgia to use Dwyer's term and also like a political nostalgia too. So like when you look at like Project Democracy, Project Truth, it's kind of a reconstitution of kind of the Truman and the Eisenhower years politically. And then in terms of style, there's a bit of a reconstitution too of kind of that 1950s era. Um, so these older celebrities, um, these, uh, even though Fonda won an Oscar that year, I don't know if they had the impact maybe that a Moxtown Sidao or a Glenda Jackson would have to international audiences. And uh, there to, was, they're the people that w w are in Wick's Rolodex. You know, he mm -hmm. couldn't ring up Chris Christopherson or somebody. You know, he didn't have he didn't have that relationship with them, but he could get um, uh, Kirk Douglas to do things. And Kirk Douglas goes on to he does a film called. Um, uh, Thanksgiving in Peshawar about Afghan refugees and really comes out and says, you know, the struggle of freedom is being fought in Afghanistan. Uh, he's in Let Poland Be Poland too, isn't he? Kirk yes, Kirk? yeah, yeah. He, he does, uh, he does, he describes a trip where he uh, made a right. film and uh, trained actors uh, within Poland. So he kind of like recounts that trip and talks about the Polish people. And um, another interesting piece of trivia is this is likely Henry Fonda's last screen appearance. Um, so he won the Oscar not too long after uh, his appearance in Let Poland Be Poland, but he, uh, Jane Fonda accepted for him on stage. So I think for anyone that's a scholar of kind of Hollywood history, this is, uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain, uh, Henry Fonda's last on screen appearance too, which is interesting in its own right. What I can also add to this is that it was also an element of affording celebrity status to people who would not have that in the United States, especially in the field of sport we see for African Americans in field of music as well, they would come to these countries and they will really gain a kind of a notoriety and, and they would be celebrities in outside of the United States and they just wouldn't have that status. And with that notion of celebrity, I just want to also add this governmental visiting projects that would be afforded to farmers. Farmers who would be picked up from Iran and other countries, they would be given free trip and uh, stay and lodging and training all. And it was a kind of celebrity status for them to come and suddenly have this pleasure and come back. And I suspect that character, that strategy was also given to American farmers as well. And this is something that really worth more investigation. Great. Um, just a small question. Does Nara have an a original unedited version of that Poland be Poland? I mentioned that some of the other copies are edited in various ways. Carol, this is, I mean, I owe yeah. my project to Carol and Mike Taylor. Uh, they, seriously, I would not have gotten where I am today without Carol's help. She's been incredible. So this is, Carol was so kind to, to find this. And yeah, so I'll let you speak to it, Carol. No, it's, uh, yes, we do have a full copy, both in Spanish, there's a Spanish version, as well as an English version. It, the original is uh, on one inch tape. So it's not in our catalog right now. Uh, it's not uploaded yet, but we do have a digital version available of that particular program. So, and it is the original. I don't know if it's the original original, it's one inch. So um, uh, I don't know, Brett, if you've been able to see more than one copy or one version of it. As far as I could tell, it was recorded from a broadcast um, on one of the PBS stations, I believe. Uh, I think it okay. only ended up showing in like 90 PBS stations. Uh, it's like. So that means 200 rejected its broadcast. Um, but I think as far as I can tell, it is one of those recordings. So I, I think it's original as far as I can tell. Yeah, in, in, the, in the UK, it was, uh, it wasn't, it was, sh it was sort of exerted on the news. So um, uh, sometimes when Wick's talking about the numbers, what he's talking about are people who had items about Let Poland Be Poland included in their news broadcast, rather than watching it unedited beginning to beginning to end, at least that's my, that's my recollection. And was widely, um, we thought, oh, there's Americans, what are they, what are they doing? Okay. But that was 1982, you know, now we realize the wisdom of it all. Yeah. I had a question about the uh, kind of genres of uh, these sorts of films. Um, so I'm curious uh, for Hadi thinking about obviously the newsreel and whether there were Soviet newsreels also being made and we had to kind of compete with an American newsreel. Uh, for Thorne, I was thinking like, do we call these films again, like educational films or the like industrial films? How does that kind of genre change depending on kind of circumstances? And if like uh, for both Brett and Nick, 
as well, we can think of that question, like what to call these films and is there a way in which these become like their own kind of film or they only respond to the certain kinds of genres, even the fact that the documentary itself becomes more common as opposed to fiction filmmaking or other kinds of ways to communicate the ideas of public diplomacy. Maybe start with Hadi. Um, or I mean, um, no, the, you know, there was no version that would, would compete with the way that United States uh, operated in Iran and um, uh, the uh, filmmaking process started prior to the coup and then intensified and the news really started after the coup, etc. But there were a um, limited number of newsreel format. We can even, I'm not sure it's just newsreel, just it's like a more of a cultural uh, films that were made at the time that part of Azerbaijan was on the, became basically an independent state. There were films made there. I think the Soviet filmmaker, if I correct, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, Chub. Um, but it could, could be wrong. But she went there, she produced the film. The film is available in a low quality and I really died to find a good version of it. Very interesting film in a way. So there was this kind of a, a tradition of Soviet filmmakers becoming active in these locations and places. We need to learn so much more about the Soviet operations and filming. I knew that they were very active in radio programming, and these were also done by Iranian intellectuals who went to Soviet Union, and they were operating through that. And we see how the, the Akhbar Iran, Iran News, um, makes these scenes of punishing people, threatening them. If you watch this radio, bad things can happen to you, etc. So the fear of this propaganda operation. But when we come to the realm of film, I don't think they could keep up with the United States. Um, I, my, my, my take on this is that you do see genre, and not, not only genre coming into James Blue's films, but he's also satirizing genre. So there's this sequence in the middle of Letter from Columbia, which is almost like the News on the March sequence in Citizen Kane, where he's actually making fun of, it's a sequence, he says, progress on the march. And uh, they have this sort of fake newsreel of speeding trains and building dams. And, uh, and so he sets up this impersonal top-down picture of progress. And then he unpacks it and uh, talks about his, his sort of bottom-up idea of involving the people. And then there's a scene on a, a, at a school. Who needs a food worker? Where people are pretending to finish painting the school. And James Blue actually explains the people love this school so much that they wanted to restage the painting of the school for my documentary camera. So here we see pictures of people pretending to finish the building. So he's sort of opening up the secrets that sometimes a documentary film scenes are staged and sometimes there, there are uh, generic ele elements that come in. So, I mean, that's why I think it's a, it, it's a, um, uh, a great film and we'll commend it to people uh, all, all of his um, films bear uh, watching thinking and talking about okay um, so uh, the the genre genre certainly transforms when the firm the, when the films circulate uh, I think the uh, so these films in China were known as industrial know-how films. Uh, so they were very much uh, understood as, as being uh, about educating uh, people in uh, forms of industrial process and making them aware that these, there are these various forms of kind of uh, heavy industry in various parts of the nation. Um, when they, uh, but I, I think the most, um, but when they come to the US, they really become uh, understood as culture films or films that are about kind of knowing and understanding Chinese culture. Uh, and I think that that's uh, an interesting aspect of industrial process films in general. Uh, Salome Sevierski does makes this argument in her book where uh, industrial process takes on different kinds of meanings uh, when we're depending on the process that's being shown and the forms of teleology that come out of 
uh, the, the, the process that is being depicted such that uh, certain processes we see as ethnographic or anthropological, look at how they do things. Other ones have a kind of futurity to it. This is how, uh, you know, this is where we're progressing. This is where we're moving. And I think that uh, distinction uh, is very important in how we understand how these films travel. Uh, and we can see that in the recutting uh, and the reframing of that film about salt as well. And just to really quickly kind of build from what Thorne uh, so wonderfully said there, um, you know, process is central to so many USIA films too, in the sense, as much as we can read technological apparatus into films, uh, you know, if, if we think to like maybe like some of the old war films where we see kind of the step-by-step -step process of kind of uh, mobilizing war, mobilizing the machinery of war, some of that transfers to a lot of the early USIA films where they they illustrate the process behind the dissemination of the film, the making, the distribution, the exhibition of the film. And so process kind of takes shape in a different way. Um, and that tradition, you know, we see it with kind of mobile film units in a lot of the films of the early 1950s, films about the mobile film units. Um, we see that with Let Poland Be Poland too. There's this kind of idea of process through broadcast, uh, broadcast bro process through satellite. But beyond that, beyond the technological apparatus, um, let Poland be Poland perhaps re resist the genre reading almost more than anything else within the catalog. It's, I can't express how strange and weird and surreal it is at certain moments. Maybe the closest, uh, the, you know, the closest paradigm that we could look to is like the telethon. And there's really not much work out there on the telethon outside of like Paul Longmore, but this kind of you know, leveraging that like a lot of pathos as to generate kind of goodwill, kind of a vague sense of goodwill. Um, so that's, that's maybe the closest genre in which we could see Let Poland be Poland operating, but yeah. Uh, I posted uh, the link to Iranian snapshoots. It's a snapshot. It's not the actual title. It's a snapshot. And this is, you know, we would expect that the local would come in with some kind of a funny response. Uh, this is like a heavily didactic discourse. It comes from Syracuse group. They're two years in Iran and they produce this film and they basically is discordance and satirizing itself their own mission is crazy and they also been framed within an iranian space so it's like a very interesting take to that which you know <laughs> definitely worth 15 minutes of your time check it out <laughs> great uh, i think i'll ask just one more question and so think about what trace do we have? What evidence do we have for how these films circulated? For how long? Where they played? Uh, thinking even the artifact itself. What does it tell us about the relative popularity or at least use of these films? So, any thoughts on that kind of question? Do we have any evidence in the material itself? So, there's one particular document that Carol actually pointed me to. Um, she she uh, showed it to me. It's a document produced in 1996 by the agency uh, of all the retired titles in the agency's history. And it has certain metadata. It has like a description when there's one available, the title, but it also says year produced, year released, and year retired. Um, not all the films have that data, but you can really like with 18,000 titles on this list, you can really kind of begin to learn about certain circulation patterns when there are peaks and when there are uh, cavern, you know, when there are peaks and when there are uh, lows. And so, so it's that 1996 document is the one I'd point people to um, so that where we can learn most about kind of like at least on a macro scale distribution patterns. I mean, we would think of these films to this question pertains the primary production time. In case of Iran, it's not. So National Archives came out, received requests, and this film came out. And these films are highly active in propaganda between various Iranian factions. These are, you know, these are very lively being watched and seen and visited, and always with a kind of framing, very important framing that wants to completely dis dis dissociate them from their main production culture, etc. So we shouldn't just be, the, I know it's like an exception of a sort, these films are highly valuable, I'll just let you guys know. <laughs> Great, okay, well, thank you so much. I think we're at time, but this is a, a wonderful panel and really interesting research. So thank you so much for sharing it. And thanks everyone in the audience for your terrific questions. Uh, we will be back at 7.30 for our final panel of today and welcoming scholars from Asia, which is really exciting. So I hope to see you in a bit. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.